Let me put my earpiece on so make sure y'all can hear me. If I can find it. Hey! This is Shalita, the nonprofit Easter O'Neill. Doing a Facebook Live, hashtag nonprofit no filter Facebook Live video, okay? Um, today we're going to be talking about creative ways that you are allowed to use your nonprofit income, okay? So whether that's donations or from, from individuals or from foundations. Hey, Raven! How you doing? Thanks for joining. Hey! Oh, oh we got some folks on here. Okay, y'all, come on with it. So thank you for joining. I'm glad that y'all are here. Y'all know, as I said, I'm going to start these Facebook Live videos up again because I was doing them a couple years ago and I stopped. So every Thursday, 12 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be on here talking about different topics around nonprofit launching, revitalization. You know, if you all have any questions um, in particular about your situation, please, you know, would we'll take this time to, to, to let me know, right? Um, I want to go over our topic first and then I'll open it up and, and y'all can, um, you know, ask me questions on topic or off topic. It doesn't even matter. Okay. So I wanted to come on today and talk about, um, what can you use your nonprofit funding for? Right? Because I, I was speaking with a client, um, maybe last week and, and she asked me, well, what can I actually use? my nonprofit funds for outside of programming, right? So a lot of us are just nonprofit visionaries just starting up and we're putting a lot of money into our nonprofit organization. And you know, that if that's your situation, that's fine and that's cool too. But I want you, when you start getting donations and, and funds in, to start thinking about, okay, well, how can I actually use this money so that it won't, my, my purse pockets, my coins, my personal coins, are not being uh, depleted, okay, right? Because I know we also wanna be very careful about how we use our nonprofit funding because you know you don't wanna get caught up in red flags or anything fishy, you know, I'm not advocating for that at all. I just want you to be clear about how you can, some you know flexibility, some leeway on how you can use the money that you have coming in. So, and I've got my little notes here, y'all, cause y'all know I'll try to stay on topic because um, you know, I, I like to talk and I go off, off, off topic and stuff, right? So, but first, first and foremost, it really depends on how your donors or your, um, there we go, um, your donors or the, uh, whether individuals or foundations request that you use their money. First and foremost, so if you're raising money and for, for a fundraiser and you're saying, okay, I'm going to use this money towards programming, I'm going to buy um, bus passes for my clients, or I'm going to um, pay for rent or housing for, for a client, and that is what you're saying you're using that money for, then you better use the money for that, okay? If a funder is saying, I'm giving you this money and this is how I want it to be spent, then you have to adhere strictly to that, and you have to make sure that you're keeping receipts so that you can prove that later on. But then we've got some situations where what we call general operating support. And although sometimes it could be few and far between funders who will actually allow you to use money on general operating, which means whatever you need to use the money on. You can put it here, you can put it there. As it pertains to your organization, they're not really tied to how you use it. They'll let you determine how you wanna use that money. And that's what we're talking about here today. When you get general operating support, you have a little bit of leeway in how you use those funds. Again, if it's programmatic, and they say, and even within the programmatic, and we'll talk about that too, but your program. So your program funds are funds that are used specifically to run your programs. So if you have a, again, I'll go back to housing. If you have a housing program, then that money is going towards the housing program and the budget that you've developed from your housing program. It's going to deliver your services. That's the work, right? That's the tangible hands-on work that you're doing with your population. Your general operating or operating 
covers things like your administrative, the stuff that has to happen in order for you to be able to provide the services. So there's your salaries, you know, if you have consultants that you're paying for, you've got office space, you've got your uh, copying, con your copier contract, those sorts of things. Keep the lights on, right? Are your operating support versus your administrative. So, and I went over that. Um, so one of the things too is that, you know, before you start to be like, all right, well, um, let me get this bank card out to pay for, you know, these things, your personal bank card out to pay for things for the nonprofit. Here are some things that you can that's a little bit more flexible, right? So if you're out and you're in a client meeting or you're meeting with someone who potentially can help your organization, this is a, this is a, 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 a nonprofit meeting, right? This is something that you are planting seeds, you're investing in your nonprofit, you're meeting with this person and or people and that is a business meeting that's considered you can use your nonprofit funds for that now rule of thumb we typically say you know or it's typically said that if there's alcohol involved okay then you personally pay for that alcohol not your nonprofit organization you know you don't want it to look like you out here key keying it up living it up drinking it up on the nonprofit's dime, right? So you pay for that or somebody else who's who's coming who's attending the meeting being that they're not paying for their food, maybe okay, well, you know, my nonprofit has this, has the food because this is a business meeting, you know, some same similar sort of rules as you're talking about for profit, right? So your nonprofit expense, maybe they can cover the alcohol because you've covered the food, okay? And another question I had was, oh, are we supposed to not go to certain places, you know, expensive or high end, or how do we determine what we can use our nonprofit funds for as it pertains to meals, like certain places? Can you not, you know, and for me, what I say is, you know, don't take advantage, but if you are schmoozing some potential sponsors for your organization and you happen to maybe, you know, or your volunteers, right? You just had a big event or a fundraiser and you want to show them your appreciation and you decide to take them to a decent restaurant to do that. You can use nonprofit funds for that. Again, though, you know, in in moderation, okay? But also make sure that the, the alcohol, you're not paying for, for the alcohol, okay? Either personally, you come out your personal pocket for that alcohol or somebody in the group who feels thankful and grateful that you're paying for the food cover the alcohol just to just you know keep it clean right but it's not like you got to take people and don't get me wrong like golden corral okay golden corral is cool you know but it ain't like you gotta be like oh i gotta go to golden corral oh i gotta take y'all to mickey d's you know because um my nonprofit paying for this if your volunteers put some time into it your staff or your team put some time into something and you want to thank them and take them to a decent restaurant, that is okay, all right? Another question was around funds was, okay, well, can I pay my car payment or can I pay my car insurance using my nonprofit funds? And so what I say is be careful, okay? Not to say that you can't, but this is, uh, this is how you can. If that car is in your nonprofit organization's name, right, that is a vehicle that your nonprofit has purchased, yes, you can. Now, your personal car payment, you know, I, there's a way to do that. Number one, let me, let me reiterate that. If the car is in your nonprofit's name, yes, because that is strictly for business, that's your nonprofit, and any, any um, expenses associated with that vehicle, if it's in the organization's name, yes. Again, these are the same principles as a for-profit situation, okay? But let's say, because as nonprofit visionaries, we're just getting started. Look, we're putting all our money into this. Nine times out of 10, you may not be taking much of a salary, right? So you're getting a stipend, so to speak, for your work. And let's say you use your vehicle a lot to travel to meetings or different things for your nonprofit organization. One thing that my organization let me do years ago was, okay, I had my salary that my organization paid me, but then I also had 
they gave me an extra stipend on top of my salary every month to go towards my car payment because I was driving so much for my nonprofit organization. So you see the, 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 the dynamic there, right? It's not, if that car is not in your nonprofit's name, then maybe, and again, you have to go to your board about these things. You can't just you know, unilaterally make certain budgetary decisions, especially if it's going to be over a certain amount of money. But, you know, because I had to go every year and that brings me um, to your budget, right? Every year you should be having your board approve your budget. Okay. My nonprofit visionaries. I know, I know we start talking about control. We want help when we want the help. But then when we have to go to people to get approval to do things, it's like, Mm, I'm good. No, no, no. It's got to be a balance. You got to have both, right? So every year, depending on the cycle of your, the calendar year of your organization, and you pick that, that could be January 1st through December 31st. Or some people do July 1st through June 30th. Whatever the situation is, may be, you should be getting with your board in advance of that next year and say, this is the budget. This is what I propose the budget be. For the next year and they have to approve it and say okay yeah okay we approve that it's okay you can spend money on that and in that budget you make sure you have different line items right so if you know that you're going to be spending a certain amount of money on meals and entertainment right for your sponsors for your volunteers for your clients you know then you put that in your budget guesstimate you know you put that on in, in your budget so that your board can approve it if you feel like you're putting um, what the organization is paying you is not a lot and you're just, you know, you're, you're putting all this time in, you're just getting started. Well, there are some things, you know, that you can negotiate with your board to offset your personal expenses that you have to keep putting in to the organization. And one of those ways, again, like I said, is if you want a stipend for your car, then you have to get that approved by the board and say, hey, I think I should get $500 a month, you know, or $400 extra over what the, the salary stipend that I'm getting to help cover my, my transportation, you know, um, or help me towards the insurance or, you know, whatever. However you use that extra stipend is how you use it, but you get it approved through the board first, okay? So those are types of, um, some, some examples and some types of examples that you wouldn't typically think about. Um, I actually knew someone, um, knew a couple of people who their organization purchased a vehicle for them um, and so, you know, because they were driving all over the state and stuff. So, you know, they purchased a vehicle. Now, let me say this, whatever, hey, I love, peace and love, um, whatever you spend money on, like, let's say you need a new computer. Okay. I need me a MacBook Pro. All right. And I'm for my nonprofit. I'm doing, you know, and then that's considered equipment. That's considered equipment. And you go and you purchase that with your nonprofit funds. Okay, that's fine. You could do that. Let's say you go and, you know, you need to get a whiteboard or other types of supplies or things like that. Okay, you can go ahead and get that. Use your nonprofit funds for that because you're going to be using that for your nonprofit. What I would say is make sure that you understand that should you leave the nonprofit, right? Let's say, you know, you decide, um, you know, you're bored, you know, you decide you want to do something different, you're moving on or something, you know, um, and you're leaving the organization, that, those, that equipment, that laptop, that car stays with the nonprofit organization because the nonprofit organization paid for it, okay? So, so that's just, that's that caveat. You know, whatever you're purchasing, even if you use it for personal use, sometimes like if you have a, a, a computer and you and your organization bought your laptop computer and you, you know, have to check your email, your personal email or, you know, do an assignment. Per, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand that that not that laptop belongs to the organization. OK. And y'all make sure y'all keep good receipts. I mean, good receipts good good paper trail on your things so that if anybody were to ever ask you oh well I see you spent money on this or you bought this laptop or you bought this projector screen you make sure on your receipts whether it's virtually or whether you I still write on my receipts when I get them what the purpose was for I met with Tammy 
or I met with this person regarding the nonprofit or, you know, make sure you keep that. Okay. Keep really good tight records. But I really just want you guys to understand that, you know, you don't always, if you get some funds in, especially if you get it from donors who have not placed any stipulations on how you use the money, there's some flexibility with that. You can use it on meals. You can use it on equipment, right? You can use it to pay yourself, y'all, okay? A stipend, if you don't, if you're not bringing in the buku dollars, right, to give yourself a, a full-time salary as of yet, make sure you put something in the budget for you because realistically, you're pouring your time, your energy, your resources into starting or growing this nonprofit organization and there should be something look at how much you have coming in you know and be realistic about and fair about what it is that maybe you can take for yourself to pay yourself for your efforts because there is no glory in burning yourself out and you know not being able to pay your bills just to say oh we all volunteer here okay well cookie Pay yourself something, okay? Hashtag nonprofit, no filter. Now, what I also wanted to touch on really quickly is I know you may have heard um, general operating ratio versus programmatic ratio. And sometimes foundations or funders, when they give you money, right, they're looking at how much money are you spending on admin or operational support versus your actual work and your program work, right? So they say the rule of thumb, depending on what fund you're talking to, because we can go into, I maybe can even do another video on the different types of funders. You know, you got your private foundations, your smaller foundations, your larger foundations, you know, like, it, it, and they all have different expectations. But we'll just say for the larger sort of mainstream um, nonprofit organization or funders, they want to make sure you don't go over more than 20% general operating or overhead and 80% programmatic expenses. So they want you to spend 80% of your overall annual budget on your programs because they feel like, oh, you're sitting here paying people all this money and you got all this overhead, you got all this salary and all these other expenses that are not program related. You know, we don't want to pay for that. We don't want to give you our money to use for that. And, and you know, I have issues with that a little bit because, hey, Jackie, oh, girl, I'm supposed to text you back. We go, okay, I got you. Um, Lord, but yeah, so you know, I feel like there's a caveat with that because it can kind of be sort of superficial. Because honestly, if you don't have, if you're not putting money towards your operating expenses, towards your salaries, towards your consultants, towards your, your office expenses, how are you going to keep the lights on to do your programs and your services, right? So that's why some funders are kind of like, eh, all right. You know, some people say, I spend 3% on overhead. Okay. Now, they say that. But then that's because they have the executive director, which is typically an admin position, right? They Then they say, oh, the executive director is 90% of their time is on programs. Or the office coordinator, which is an operating expense. Oh, 90% of their time is spent on programmatic things. So they kind of get away, you know, can finagle the percentages, but overall rule of thumb, just try to keep an eye on it. Okay. You don't want to be out here. You got all this, you got, you ride in the car for your nonprofit. You got your, 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 your laptop and your, and your printer and your, all these things. And then you done help one person. Okay. That don't make no sense. <laughs> so trying to keep it balanced, but understand that, you know, there is that thing out there floating out there from, from funders that's like, okay, make sure you keep an eye. No more than 20% of money should be used on your operating costs, okay? So, with that being said, did anybody anybody have any questions? Are you, you know, about this in particular? Or if there's another burning question, nonprofit question you have for me, come on now. You got me and it's free. So, so any questions? And I'm, I know this can be a, a little bit of a delay, so I'm looking here to see just jump in the comment section. Just, you know, got a question, got a thought before I, cause I'll recap on the topic that I, you know, we just were talking about or what you can use. Um, Raven. Okay. It's so a super informative and detailed. Thanks for the great tips. My pleasure. My pleasure. I try to, you know, these are some things that unless you've actually, 
you know, been running an organization on from the ground up, there's some caveats and things that you may not, you know, know. And some people don't know to tell you unless they've been there. So I really, you know, on, on the front end, I want you guys to, um, you know, to know this stuff because, again, you spend so much money out your own personal pocket when you do have a pot of nonprofit money that you should be using for the purposes of your nonprofit. So, okay, Nichelle, you said, I've been trying to understand how to get the funding to even build the budget. Ah, uh, and that's a whole nother video. But, um, you know, first and foremost, what I like to tell my nonprofit visionaries is you want to make sure that your brand, like the, the basics is covered, right? That you, you've got, and I don't know if this is you, um, um, or not, right? But, um, you know, make sure that you have your basis covered. You got a tight, you know, mission, vision, goals. You know what you want your programs to be very specific. You know what you want your outcomes to be and you have your budget set up already. Like those are things that you need to have in place first. Your website, right? Make sure you have a website clean, clear, crisp, right? And interactive. And when I say that, you know, visuals, things like that. Make sure you have those things in place first because when you start asking people for money, they're going to go to your website and they want to see those types of things. And I go over that in the Dream Your Nonprofit in a Weekend online module, right, on my website. I'll put the link and everything below, but I go through that, right? So make sure you have those things in place first before you start talking about the money because people are going to have some questions, okay? And so, Darice, she said, how do you know your um, NPO credit? So it operates and it depends on what you're talking about, right? So in that essence, it's not like a business where you have a uh, a, a credit score, so to speak, and people look at your uh, this this number, right, um, to determine whether or not you can be trusted with money. It's different with the nonprofit um, because when you talk about funders, right, where are you getting the money from? The, 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 number one, right? So if you're talking about your credit as in as a nonprofit, whether funders are going to give to you, they look at other things, right? They look at how you keep your, your books, your financials, right? Are they clean? Are they crisp? Are they clear, right? Um, you know, your history, your financial history, some of the same stuff that a creditor would look at, but it's not the same as far as scores are concerned. Now with your bank, if you're talking about getting a credit card through your bank, for your nonprofit organization, they look at some of some of the same things um, as they would for a for-profit, but not necessarily around scores are concerned. Um, let me take that back. You as a nonprofit funder, founder, if you're going in to try to get a credit card similar to a business, they're going to look at your credit too. They're going to look at your credit. They're going to look at the credit of the um of or the the track record of the nonprofit, how much money you tend to keep in the account, those sorts of things. That's a whole nother conversation too. And it'd probably be best to ask to go to your bank or who you bank with for your nonprofit to to ask them what their what their criteria is because it could be different, right? But it all depends on when you talk about MPO credit, who you're um who who you're who you're trying to get money from, what kind of credit you talk about. Okay. Um What's the best way to operate as both nonprofit and for profit? Okay, so they have to be separate. There's no way around it. So you have to have a firewall. You have to have a nonprofit organization and a for profit organization, separate entities, separate filing processes, right? Um, as far as how they interact, then that's something different, right? So um, I know I have a for profit, and um, and so my for-profit can donate it. I have a for-profit and a non-profit, but, but they're two separate entities that I have to still set up as two separate entities. They can work together. So my for-profit can donate to my non-profit or my for-profit staff can provide services to my non-profit organization at little or no cost, but there has to be an agreement, a written agreement between the two entities. So between your board on your foundation or your nonprofit side, your board members have to agree, you know, or um, be a part of the decision making with that. So, you know, you draft up an agreement and say, my nonprofit is going to be interacting with my for-profit in this way, these, this, you know, lay it all out. 
So your board is going to have to agree to that. And then you on your, because, you know, if you have a, um, I mean, there's some nonprofit or for profits that have boards too. But if it's just you on this side, but your board president is going to have to sign that, you know, that agreement. You can't be signing the agreement for both entities, if that makes any sense. So you just want to be, you know, careful about how you do the two. Um, it makes sense that when people say, well, how do I determine whether or not I'm going to do a nonprofit and a for-profit? Well, if you have an, a, a business or service or products or whatever that you know people going to pay for, then I would say that have that be a for-profit. Now, you can have a nonprofit component, but you still have to have a separate entity, right? But you can have a nonprofit component where let's say um you you um people who can't afford to pay for your business or your services or your products you extend you know that to them in some way you can do that through your nonprofit because then you you know you have somebody got to pay for it you know if your nonprofit if your for profit not paying for it you have to have a nonprofit that other people can pay for so that this disadvantaged or under-resourced population can take advantage of the services of your for profit i hope that makes sense but all in all, they need to be separate. Separate, 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 separate. Got it. Got your EIN number here and your articles of incorporation here and your EIN number here and, you know, two separate things. And then you have an agreement on how they work together. I hope that's helpful. Um, and Ella, what is the DUNS number good for? So, okay. So the DUNS number, they typically ask you for that if you're applying for a federal grant. Now, you just get started, we ain't going to have that conversation because you're not going to get it. You're not going to get a federal grant. Anybody tell you they that they're going to get write a federal grant for you for five to $10,000 and they're going to, you know, write it all up for you and you only been around for like a year or two or three, right? And you have limited financial history and you, the nuns number is cute and it's nice, right? For when it comes time for, for those type of, um, you know, for federal for federal grants, you know, because then they want to make sure they track you and things like that. And not to say it's not important to learn more about your DUNS number and how you can, you know, build that out. But to be real, out of my 10 years running at one foundation and number, um, I used my DUNS number a couple times applying for, for federal grants. And other than that, it didn't affect me being able to get funding or any of that, you know. So, eh, I'm going to be real with you now. I'll tell you the truth, okay? All right, come, any other questions? Come on now, come on now, y'all. You got me. You got me. Any other questions? I'm glad it makes sense, Jackie, too. Yeah, yeah, because it, it can get a little, you know, a little confusing, a little, how I'm going how I'm to do this, you know? You can do it. It's got to take, take a couple steps, like, in between. Got to be safe. Don't want the IRS coming after you, nothing like that, you know. Okay. So I'll recap real quick on, I mean, if you still have questions, please let me know. Drop drop them in the comments. I don't, don't be shy. So you have to build credit. Now, to get funding, you don't really have to build credit, right, for your nonprofit. So, um... But not to say it's a bad thing, right? You naturally are going to be doing that. Let's say once you get to a point where you um, have a track record with your bank, your nonprofit has a track record with your bank, and you have, maybe they did give you a credit card. The bank gave you a credit card, okay? And then you have some other accounts, maybe some cell phone accounts. Maybe you have a copier, you know, account. Um, you know, once you get to that point where you're expanding, those things add up to your credit. Like, how are you paying those things on time? But again, it's not associated with a credit score for a nonprofit organization. It's, you know, if you're going to a copying company, right, because you, you got 10 people and y'all need a copier that's heavy duty, then, you know, they're going to be looking at your financial statements. They're going to be looking at how much money you bring in every year. Um, you know, they're going to be looking at those types of things. And if it is something like you said, so would it help? Will will HUD help you with building to how to house your girl? So building a house to that's another loaded. That's another like. No, HUD's not gonna help you do that. Now, you're gonna have to identify a house um, or a property yourself, 
and um, maybe get some funders and stuff lined up and look into some of the programs and HUD may, ha may have, you know, once you decide you want to purchase that property. And again, purchasing the property, is it going to be in your name, right? Is it going to be in your nonprofit's name? Even if it's in your nonprofit's name, you or someone on your board, your treasurer are going to have to be signers for it. So they're going to look at somebody credit. <laughs> okay. So that's just, you know, how they, how they do things. But depending on, you know, um, depending on that process, you know, then in HUD's, HUD's, um, they're also their process on how, what they fund and how they, you know, it, it really depends on that. Um, there was a time where I, um, where I was looking into getting a property for my nonprofit organization and I was trying to see if maybe it could be section eight housing and that sort of thing. HUD comes in later. If you don't have a plan on how you're going to pay for that, or at least put a down payment, or at least have you or your board members in a, in a position where somebody can co-sign or, you know, use their credit in order to even be considered, I wouldn't even go that far. And if you don't have, um, a, a built up network, right on, or plan, on how, once you get that house, how you gonna pay for all the expenses? Because that was another thing. Okay, with the house, all right, you gotta pay, um, of course, we already know, what the, you know, you gotta pay the mortgage, you gotta pay the insurances, but you're talking about a program, think about program-related costs. You're gonna be repairing stuff often. You're gonna be replacing stuff often. Like, you, it's a lot that goes into it, right? But if we work together one-on-one, -on -one, we'll go over that, we'll get to that. But first and foremost, Make sure the foundation of your organization, you have the network, you have the the um, the reputation, right? Because you're going to need to have collaborations and partnerships. You're talking about getting a property. You're going to need to get your legislators involved. It's a whole lot of that, okay? Um, and then, Darice, what is the average price that I should pay for a grant writer to write a grant? Now, listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. Hashtag nonprofit, no filter. And I don't know your situation because I haven't talked to you one on one. If you just getting started, okay, it ain't about paying a grant writer. Do not waste money on a grant writer, okay? Because your money is gonna come from your network and building relationships. You have to first find out who cares about what you do, how to get in contact with them to set up a meeting first. So you have some FaceTime and you build up a rapport with that person because they're not paying or supporting your organization. They're supporting you, right? Typically the grant writing or the grant proposal is a tool. So after you sat down and you've met with people and they're like, hmm, I like you. I like what you're doing. Send me something. You can get a common grant application that's, that most of the foundations use and plug and play. All right. Now you may not be a good writer. You may not, they may not be, you know, we all have different skills and talents and that may not be one of your skills and talents or one of the things you even want to bother with. Right. But I would say if you got money to just throw away like that for, you know, just to pay somebody to write something for you, when you can just go and download a common grant application form and just plug and play and look at some examples and, you know, then, then, you know, more power to you. Now, once you get to the point where your organization is established and let's say, you know, you've got um, foundations and funders who are interested in you and that have been giving you money and you're just getting overwhelmed with writing the grant proposal, you know, or maybe you do, you have gotten to a point where you have built your organization up and you're applying for a federal grant and you're competitive enough. Y'all got to be competitive enough for these federal grants because they're no joke. And then once you get them, if you get them, you have to have a whole individual person, a whole a role, right? And a whole staff person that is just um, focused on reporting and making sure that you are collecting data and information and applications and all that for that. That's a whole nother conversation. But if you get to that point, then paying somebody to do a federal grant, now that's where you pay somebody because those things are beasts. Okay, they they it's a lot. I've seen grant federal grant proposals that are 100 pages. All right, but you don't pay somebody to write you a three to five page grant uh, grant proposal. Okay, that's that's not what you do. Number one, you build relationships up first, and then you give them the grant proposal. I hope that makes sense. Um, so yeah, don't 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 pay nobody. 
pay me to come in and help you build some stuff up and give you some some templates or somebody like me before you start paying somebody to get you money that you're not even ready for okay um raven is there a different accounting or tracking process for keeping track of donated items um and sponsored items for example a laptop that was donated or a venue sponsoring the space for an event um now we start to get into the accounting bookkeeping categories and things like that. And it all depends on how you want to keep your books. But if you're just starting out, no problems, Aris. Um, if you're just starting out, then um, it just depends on in QuickBooks how you label those things. Um, I wouldn't say there are separate accounting practices. There's just different ways you'd label them and in different categories. If you have something, you know, you'll have an in-kind category and you'll put in a certain amount to that. And then you'll have, you know, if it's an actual, um, an, an, a line item that you actually pay for, you know, it's all about how you code it in, in, in your accounting software. And if it's, you know, I've, I've used QuickBooks, so, you know, that it, it depends on that, but you don't have, it doesn't have to be a headache at all. It's just, you know, I, and QuickBooks online, you it'll ask you in how you want to code this in kind. Okay. Boom, bam, blip. You do that. Did that answer your question, Raven? Okay. Yeah. Don't. Listen, y'all, we don't want to make stuff harder on ourselves <laughs> than it has to be, you know, but you want to keep good books and everything like that. But, you know, you don't have to have a whole separate, um, you know, thing for that. Okay. Come on, y'all. Y'all got questions. Come on. A couple of y'all all here. Come on. Ready. I'm about to drink some coffee. Come on. Okay. In kind donations. I've heard of that. So it should be tracked. And yeah. Everything. Everything should be tracked and coded. But it's easy, right? Once you take a look at it. It's easy to do that. Um, would you account for the volume of the, the item? Yes. Um, you would put that in there. And then in some cases, they also, and this is why it's just good to have an accountant or CPA to handle your books because then they'll know like certain things depreciate over time. So you might have um, a desk or something um, that was um, donated to you in kind. And every year you're claiming that desk as long as you have it, but every year it depreciates. And so when you, when it doesn't necessarily account towards the assets of your nonprofit organization, the same every year, you know, that's the whole different, that's the, you know, the, one of the big reasons why we keep track of the in-kind stuff and the monetary value associated with that, because it counts as your assets your, towards your overall assets of your nonprofit organization. Um, like the monetary value or just that it was donated. So, um, what, if you're going to track it in QuickBooks, you have to put a number to it. So if, um, you know, typically if somebody donates something to me, I ask them what the cost was, you know, cause when you do their tax determination or their, I, their, um, tax letter to recognize what they gave you as a donation, you need to put the amount in that too, because they're going to want that for their tax purposes to be able to write that off. So whatever they say that that is that um, desk or whatever is worth is what you would put it for in your accounting. Okay. And I would recommend you guys because questions like this, I'm not, a, I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. I'm going off of the many years of me having to do my own books and then working with, um, my bookkeeper and accountant who are just amazing and gone through audits and all kinds of stuff. So I'm, I'm going off of that knowledge, but as you're building your nonprofit, make sure you're looking for board members who are, you know, a CPA, an accountant, because these types of questions are going to come up along the life of your nonprofit. And it's good to have them on the board because when it's time to do your 990s or do your tax paperwork, you'll also have somebody on board to help you with that. Okay. So. Unibomb Raven. Here I got my crystals on, girl. Got my crystals on. Okay. Oh, fine. All right, now come on. Any other questions? No question is a dumb question. I just want you to know that. So if you something's been burning on your mind, on your heart, um, and and you about your nonprofit, and you want to ask, please ask because whoever's going to be seeing this video, they're going to hear your question, and they might have the same question because I'm recording it. I'm going to record it. I'm going to put it all over the world, okay? So. All right? I'm going to give you a second. Hold on. Let me sip my coffee.
I don't see nothing else pop up there. All right, so recap purposes because I know a couple people joined in afterwards after I, um, you know, started talking about other topics. The main topic of this is how can you use the the donations and the funds that you get, right, to offset your own personal pockets, okay? Because once you start getting funding in, you shouldn't just be digging all in your pocket. You get used to that. You get in the routine of paying for everything out your pocket, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Okay, when it, when you have some money that comes into your organization and you're doing something that has anything, anything to do with your nonprofit organization. Look, if you're traveling somewhere, okay, and you're going to be meeting someone there for the for the benefit of your nonprofit organization, and you you can get the airplane to if you have general operating money, you can use that for your travel. That should be a line item in your budget. Travel. You think ahead the year before. Hmm. Next year, I'm going to go to a conference for my non that's for the benefit of my nonprofit. I'm going to have to fly there. I'm going to have to drive there. Put that money, that guesstimated money, into your budget, right? So then when you go there, you're not coming out your own personal funds to catch a plane to do something for your nonprofit organization. Leverage your money, but keep good records and know the difference between general operating support and programmatic support. If a funder, I don't care if it's an individual or a foundation, tells you, this is how I want you to use my money. I want you to use my money to provide um, emergency um, support to um, youth that are in, in, in school, students that are in school, and I want, like, you better use that money for them, okay? <laughs> Make sure you use that money, because when it comes time to report, they want to see that. Now, if they say, I've had funders that say, here's 15,000, here's 20,000, here's 30,000, Use it to support your program, your general operating. However you want to use it, just as long as you use it for your nonprofit organization. With those funds, you have flexibility. You can pay for meals. You can make sure you can pay yourself a stipend to cover car expenses. All right? That's approved by your board first. All right? So in addition to the stipend that you get, the money that you're paying yourself for the work that you're doing, if you drive your car a lot for your organization, then make sure you ask your board, hey, to offset some of my, my costs for, for, for this, especially since I'm not getting paid a whole lot, can I have a $500 um, stipend on top of my stipend, um, you know, for uh, for getting paid, you know, to support, to offset some of these costs? And if they say, hey, yeah, why not? Then that's how you do it. But if that car is not in your nonprofit's name, you do not pay directly from your nonprofit funds to pay your car payment or your insurance, Okay. I'm, look, I ain't going to let y'all go out like that, okay? All right, and, and Sandra, you said, um, Sandra, you, you said, I need to know how to write a grant proposal. And that's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I don't want to make it more simple than it is, right? But there, but it is pretty simple. It's, there are, are what they call a common grant application form where it's the same, like different, they'll, they'll show you, and they show you, they tell you what they want in each section. And you can look at other examples. But again, I don't want, oh my gosh, sorry, somebody called. I don't want y'all to, um, to get caught up in grant proposals. It's not the grant proposal. It is your relationship with people who have the money. The grant proposal is what they give you, or what they ask you for, afterwards right and not to say you should people typically don't fund blind grant proposals if they don't know who you are if none of their funder the, or 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 grantees the the organizations that they're funding because funders talk to each other they talk to each other and they talk to the people that they already fund so if you come in you send a blind grant proposal and you know they look at that and even if they're intrigued by what you do, they're going to go to their grantee, their grantees and say, have you heard of this organization? Do they have credibility in the community? They're going to go to other funders and say, have you funded this organization? Do they have credibility in the community? First and foremost, to try to see who has a relationship with you. If no one can vouch for you and you're just, in, in, and you're just sending a blind grant proposal, more than likely you will not get that grant. You're wasting your time. Where you need to put your time is relationship development and finding out who these funders are, making an appointment to meet with them, to just learn who they are and tell them who you are. Not, don't ask them for nothing. You go in and you meet, hey, I've, 
I saw your website and you see that you care about these these focus areas or these causes. This is what I fit into that because I do A, B, and C. Tell me more about what's on what's you know what you're hoping to support or hoping to see your grant money do for you this year. You know whatever. Like first and foremost, you leave them with a little something about your organization once you leave. And then, you know, you follow up. Now, if they've not, at the end of that conversation, they may say, okay, well, you know what? What you're doing does fit in with what we would like to see or what we would like to support. So our grant proposal deadline is blah, 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 blah. It's coming up. Submit something. Then you submit something. Because when it comes in, they'll say, oh, I met with Sandra. I like her organization. Okay. All right. I might give her a chance. But if you send something blind in, it's not going to happen. I'm just going to be real. I'm going to be real with you. Okay? So don't focus so much or get so, don't get anxious, you know, overwhelmed with grant writing per se. Right? Just establish a relationship first. So Ellie said, if you have your own car, can you get money back for the gas that you use to go places for your nonprofit? So if you can, if that has, if that's an understanding, right, that, um, again, when you set up your budget, your nonprofit budget. And you say you put a line item as transportation costs, right, for you, and your board says approves that that budget, then yes, you keep your receipts. And what typically might happen is instead of you going to the pump and paying, you know, um, paying out the nonprofit's money for for gas, you might just have to get that receipt and get reimbursed. That's the cleaner way to do it. Right. And say, OK, I pay, you know, for this month or whatever I've driven for my nonprofit. Right. Where are you you're not driving on road trip for your personal road trip and be like, I'm a nonprofit going to pay for this. I wouldn't advise you to do that. <laughs> but, you know, it's just how you do it. You can do it. It's just set it up so it's clean. So if anybody looks at your books or looks at you doing what you're doing and say, you can say, listen, my board approved this in the budget. Here are my receipts. This is. This is where I was, uh, my mileage for, you know, no different than anything else, even your for-profit or, you know, your, your nine to five, right? If, if they, if they extend that, that, um, that perk to you, they want you to give receipts first and then they reimburse you. Okay. You got to keep it clean. Keep it clean. Okay. Any other questions, nonprofit questions? I know we started out this conversation on how can you use your nonprofit funds and the flexibility in it to prevent you from having to come out your personal pocket for everything but any other questions because we got how much time we got y'all because y'all know I'm, i don't try to keep y'all long because i know you're busy let's see what we got here what we got oh 47 so we got 13 minutes if you want to use them Nonprofit questions any other questions For those of you who just started up your nonprofit and you need some, you know, need some support with building it out, or let's say you, you haven't quite filed the paperwork or anything yet, like you're still thinking through it, we're going to be having, on starting February 1st, we're going to have Launch Your Nonprofit in 28 Days Challenge, okay? And so I'll put the link um, below too for that, but you can go to my website, Shalita O'Neill. S H A L I T A O N E A L E dot com and sign up for that challenge. It also comes with the nonprofit visionary toolkit I told you guys about that has a laminated vision board in it. It has appointment cards in it. It comes with the nonprofit Dream Your Nonprofit in a Weekend Vision Book. Everything you're going to need to walk through your starting up your nonprofit in 28 days. Okay. I'll add you to the. Um, Add you to the Facebook page, the challenge Facebook page, right before the first, right? So every day a new video will be posted on walking you through starting your nonprofit templates, video, my videos, templates, other information that's going to walk you through. So at the end of the 28 days, your paperwork, your filing paperwork should be done, okay? You should have your mission, vision, goals, programming, budget outcomes all the things you're going to need to start raising money should be done after the at the end of february all right so if you're serious about it you need some help 
some support. And even if you've already started your organization, but it went dormant and you're trying to revitalize it and you got to go back to the drawing board and revisit some things, I suggest you join as well because it'll be good for you too. So, Doris, is it okay to pay volunteer stipends? If that is something, again, that you and your board have agreed um, that that's okay, um, yeah, you, you can do that. Um, they no longer become, they're no longer considered volunteers though, right? If you're giving them stipends. Now, what most people will do is reimburse volunteers for any out-of-pocket expenses that they have that's, that's associated with your event organization or whatever. If they have to pay for gas or mileage, or, you know, to get to an event that they're doing for you or participating in with you, then, um, you know, then yeah, you should be, if you have the funds, you should reimburse them for any out-of-pocket expenses. But as far as paying for their time or anything like that, like that, they're not a volunteer at that point. They're a consultant, you know, um, so, but you can pay them. You can, you can, you can do what you want to do, right? But just be careful about what you label it and um, be careful about why you, you're paying it. You're paying stipends to, to volunteers. Okay. Just be aware of that. Um, oh, thanks, Ella. I'm trying out here, girl. Hold on, why I got to show my face? Y'all ain't tell me I had to show my face. I ain't see it. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to be helpful because I know that starting up a nonprofit can be overwhelming. And I know that the first thing that we think about is we have a passion. We want to go out here. We want to make change. And we want to make money. We want to hurry up and bring money into the nonprofit so that we're not coming out of our own pockets. And we rush things. And so we, we do things we don't need to do. We spend money we don't need to spend. We get hemmed up and then it gets overwhelming. We just say, forget it. I don't want that to happen to you all. I want you to know the ins and outs and to be aware of what to expect so that you can be successful because you have a dream in your heart. And if you're able to bring it to life, it's going to benefit so many people, including first and foremost, it's going to benefit you because most of the times we do things in areas where we need heal healing, right? We do things because we can relate. We've been through something and we don't want to see other people go through the same thing. And we lead with our heart, our heart, our heart. So the person that's going to be healed and, and supported through this, first and foremost, is going to be you. And so be careful about your healing. Don't rush through something that's then ultimately going to hurt you even more and make you not want to do your nonprofit. I'm here to help you avoid those things. Okay. I've been there, done that. And I just, I just want, I just want to see y'all successful. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? No? Okay. So again, I'll say launch your nonprofit and 28 day challenge starts February 1st. Revitalizing the organization, launching an organization, you need to be a part of the challenge and you need to bring someone with you. So I have a little promotion that if somebody that you know joins the challenge because of you, then you'll get an hour of free coaching from me, okay? So for every person that you bring along with you on this challenge and they join, okay, you get an hour free of coaching. So please let that be in a sense of, I'm really trying the best I can to make it affordable, to make it accessible so that you get this information, okay? And also, if you just, you know, maybe you don't want to do the challenge right now, but you still need some support, I have online modules for the Dream Your Nonprofit in the weekend. There's a Seed Your Nonprofit for Success all on my website. And the two of those cost together $157. Come on, y'all. Come, come on, y'all to get the knowledge and the templates and the information that I'm giving you so that you can be successful for your nonprofit, I'm telling you, like, I don't know what else, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. If that don't help you, I don't know what else to do. So go to the website, look through it. You know, if you want some one-on-one -on -one support, I'm always here. We can schedule an initial call, all right, just to kind of get an assessment of which, where you are, what you need, how I can help, and you know, the resources that I have that can best support you. So I'm here as a support, okay? All right, I don't see any other um I don't see any other questions or thoughts. So with that, y'all be blessed, okay? Um if you think of something later, a question later, put it in the in the group, 
or you know post it put it put it put it as a post in our nonprofit visionary academy group and i'll answer it um or you know give you a resource um if if you need a resource okay okay y'all well have a blessed day and i will talk to y'all next thursday same place same time different topic if there's a topic that you want me to to discuss next time put it in the comments or even post it in a group whatever say shalita please talk about this i need i need to know more about this and i'll and i'll talk about it next time all right until next time be blessed